Our next problem, illustrating additivity in conditional probability, has a classical provenance. This is called the ballot problem. And here is a clean and simple version of this problem. Imagine that you have a class election in a class with 10 students. And uh, there are two protagonists who are competing for the exalted role of class prefect. Say, let's call them Jane and Bob. Jane picks up six votes. Bob picks up four votes. So Jane wins the election. Imagine that the ballots are counted in some random order. What are the chances that as you begin a running count, starting with the first ballot cast, what are the chances that Jane leads at every step of this process? Of course, Jane wins the election. But as you count, is it the case that Jane took an early lead and never relinquishes it? Now, here is a particular instance of this problem. Right? So imagine you have 10 ballots cast in this particular order I've shown you, starting with the ballot for Jane, then a the ballot for Bob, then a the ballot for Jane, and so on down. Six in total for Jane, four in total for Bob. Now let's start a running count on the left. With the first ballot cast, Jane's count is one, Bob's is zero. With the second ballot cast, Bob picks up a, a vote, Jane is one, Bob is one. With the third ballot cast for Jane, Jane is now two, Bob is still one, and you go on down, and by the time the tenth ballot is cast, Jane has accumulated six, and Bob has accumulated four. Clearly, in this particular example, Bob has managed to draw even with or even surpass Jane's count at several places in the count, though, of course, he eventually loses the election. Now, we are now talking about sequences of ballots where Bob never catches up with Jane. Of course, one can imagine combinatorial ways of attacking this problem. But already you can see that there is, it is not trivial, it is actually of some complexity. For instance, what if Jane had, let's say, 51 votes out of 100 and Bob 49? What does your intuition tell you? What are the chances that Jane will lead at every step of the count? Yeah. If it's 51 to 49, then every vote is essentially a coin flip. There's almost just a one in two chance that a given vote goes to Jane or Bob. In such a setting, one might expect that there are frequent lead changes, but that eventually Jane gets her nose ahead and wins. Uh, if you were to put a numerical estimate of the chance that Jane actually leads at every step, what do you think it might be? Uh, think about it for a minute. Right? We will do the formal analysis in a moment, but what does instinct tell you? Now, if one wants a formal attack to the problem, then one might as well deal with it in abstract. Suppose Jane gets n votes in an abstract setting, and Bob gets m votes in this abstract setting. Naturally enough, we will require n to be bigger than m, else Jane will eventually lose the election and Bob will have surely caught up with her and surpassed her. So let us ask this following question now. We have a runoff election between two candidates. n plus m ballots are cast. Jane gets n, Bob gets m. The ballots are counted in some random order. And a running count is maintained from the first ballot to the last. At the end of the game, Jane wins, n is bigger than m. But what is the chance that the running count favors Jane at every step of the process? This problem has got an ancient and classical vintage. This was analyzed by W. A. Whitworth in 1878 by combinatorial methods. We shall look at the problem through a different prism. Conditioning ideas in this setting provide an elegant and beautiful approach 
which unlocks the problem very elegantly. Right? So let's think about how one might approach such a problem. Now, before we launch into the details, before we utilize the, the mechanism which is part of this mathematical subject, one should always pause and think about the problem holistically. At the end of the day, issues like these all concern problem solving. And problem solving demands that one understand the logic of the problem before one jumps into it and tries to utilize this formula or that. Right? We should want a principled basis for how we approach a problem. This problem looks rather complex. How should one approach it? Well, one suggestive line of thought arises from the observation that this is in the class of problems which are described sequentially, one ballot at a time. And in sequential problems, it transpires that a frequently efficacious method is to look at what happens at a given step in that sequence. And typical useful steps to look at are the first step or the last step. You might be reminded of the ancient Chinese proverb attributed to Lo Tzu from about the 5th century before the Common Era, where Lo Tzu says, and transcribing very, very roughly, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. When you have a sequential problem, it is useful very frequently to ask what happens after a given step, say the first step, or perhaps the last step. So let's look at the problem now from a visual point of view. N plus M ballots are cast. I have arranged them on a screen for you from left to right, labeled 1, 2, 3, up till N plus M. N of those ballots go to Jane. M go to Bob. This is a chance experiment and so our first question inevitably is what is the sample space? What is the space of idealized outcomes of this conceptual experiment? So let's begin with this. Now naturally the sample space consists of all such sequences comprising N J's, J for Jane, and M, B's, B for Bob. All such sequences, of course we could enumerate them, but if N and M are even modestly large, this is a very large but finite sample space. What does a random ordering of ballots mean? Well, this gives us a probability measure at hand. The probability measure here is implicitly combinatorial. It is comprised of atoms where every atom has equal probability. All sequences of NJs and MBs are equally likely. This is our mathematical model. And finally then we come to the question of what are the relevant events of interest to us? Naturally enough, the question posed is the event that Jane leads at every step of the way. Now, this is easy to describe in language, but when you think about this in our mathematical framework, we realize this is not at all simple to describe. We are looking at sequences of n plus m, j's and b's, and arranged in such a way that the running count of j's at every one of the n plus m steps exceeds the running count for b's. Okay, now, in a given example, I can write down a sequence. For example, NJs to begin and MBs to follow. This clearly has a desired property. Jane takes a massive early lead, in fact, gets all the votes up front, and by the time the nth ballot is cast, she leads by N to zero. And then Bob plays catch up, but it's too little, too late, because by the time the last ballot is cast, he's still only got to M, which is smaller than N. Here's one example of such a sequence. You could construct other examples on a trial and error basis, but clearly this is very complex, right? You could imagine situations where Jane leaps ahead and then Bob catches up partway and then Jane jumps ahead again and Bob catches up a little bit more. Okay, this looking, is looking very, very, very complicated. And any attempt at writing down an entire samples, uh, 
an event from the sample space based on these, on these lines of thought is going to involve significant complexity. Let us pause and ask, are there ancillary events of interest to us which could simplify the problem, partition the problem? And we will appeal to the wisdom of Lo Tzu and say, well, what can we say about a step, one step in this journey of n plus m steps? It turns out for this problem that a very profitable step to look at is indeed the last step.